What's Up? Doc Mike. Public Health on Call. By Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today's topic for December 2, 2020. Overdose and the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to Season 2 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, as part of a periodic series on overdose and the pandemic, Dr. Brendan Saloner, a Bloomberg Associate Professor of American Health, speaks with Michael Botticelli, the former head of the Office of the National Drug Control Policy in the Obama administration. They discuss the origins of the current overdose crisis, policy solutions to address overdose, and the importance of combating stigma against addiction. Let's listen. Michael Botticelli, welcome to the Public Health on Call podcast. Thanks, it's good to be here today. Great, well, I wanna start with your background. So you served in the Obama administration as the head of the Office of the National Drug Control Policy, and that position sometimes called the drug czar. But your journey to that job was notable for two reasons. First, you're not a cop, which I think is different than many heads of the ONDCP. And your background is in treatment and social services. And then second, you're a person who yourself is in long-term recovery. I just wanted to get you to reflect on what unique experiences or background you think you brought to that position. So I'll start with the first point that you make in terms of my background being a little bit different than the historic background of previous directors of that office. And, and, you know, it was no coincidence that, you know, those directors often came from military and law enforcement backgrounds. And I think that was highly representative, not only of kind of the federal strategy, but our historic view of substance use issues being an issue for law enforcement versus a health issue that we need to focus on from a health perspective. So what I think my position represented by a difference in background was also a difference in strategy of thinking about how do we move this away from a criminal justice law enforcement issue and cement it as a health issue, right? And so that's reflected not only in kind of federal strategy, but also federal funding, right? So if you look at the history of federal funding, uh, much of it was spent on supply side uh, strategies, supply side in our language, meaning, you know, law enforcement eradication in Mexico and Colombia. So, you know, so, so I think my background was notable because I think it reflected, you know, a difference in strategy through the Obama administration. And then particularly, I think my work in Massachusetts, particularly at the Massachusetts Health Department, I think was kind of reflective of a lot of the work that Uh, Massachusetts was doing and continues to do at the forefront of the opioid epidemic. So things like naloxone distribution, syringe service programs, uh, increasing access to medication-assisted treatment, more integration of addiction services within a host of healthcare settings. So I think that that, I think, was one of the reasons that I, you know, I ultimately came in to this position. And then, uh, you know, kind of Lastly, and probably most importantly, as a person in long-term recovery, I think that it also represents, you know, the opportunities that we have. And I, I shouldn't say it as an opportunity. I think the responsibility that we have, regardless of where we are doing this work, of having affected people being part of the policy and decision-making function uh, and the programmatic function of what we do, right? So you know, this kind of expropriated the expression, nothing about us without us. And, you know, I think the best work that we do, you know, has to include affected people as part of the decision-making process. And so, you know, I think having someone in recovery was not only highly symbolic, but I think allowed me to bring, you know, a personal understanding of these issues, not just an academic perspective. 
And I think that personal experience is so important because the numbers themselves are incredibly intimidating. And I, I wonder if you could just start off by talking about what the opioid epidemic looked like when you came to the ONDCP and where it's kind of gone from there. You know, I have to say that, you know, I came to ONDCP when at a time, and particularly from my perspective at the state level, where I did not feel like there was a significant, robust, and urgent response to the opioid epidemic. And, you know, I was watching, you know, Massachusetts was, you know, because of our historic, you know, higher heroin use rates in Massachusetts and New England, I think experienced a lot of the opioid epidemic earlier than other parts of the country. So, you know, watching these numbers go up and go up dramatically and really not seeing kind of a robust federal response, you know, to this issue. You know, so I came at a time when I really felt like, you know, we needed to significantly amp up our response to this issue and, you know, to really look at, you know, how do we, how do we mount a sufficient response to this issue? Uh, and it was a, you know, quite honestly, a daunting challenge. I recall thinking like, oh my God, you know, this is a, a huge kind of feat here in terms of being able to do that. But I will say that, you know, I do think particularly in the last two years of the administration that, you know, we were successful in getting people's attention to this issue, getting additional funding, you know, looking at other kind of congressional changes around the epidemic. But, you know, it was coming to Washington at a time where there needed to be a response that even, you know, kind of approximated the magnitude of the problem. And in 2014, when you came to the administration, we had already transitioned from an overdose crisis largely driven by prescription opioids to one that had, at that time, was mainly a heroin overdose crisis. Yeah. And then in the last years, I think a significant trend has been the rise of illicit fentanyl. Can you talk a little bit about how fentanyl has made our strategy so much harder? Sure. I, I want to talk first about how one of the most frustrating aspects of my job at the federal level was the lack of timeliness of data that we had in terms of not even knowing where we are now, you know, but I think when I got to Washington and even in Massachusetts, I think our overdose data at that point was lagging by about two years, right? And so, you know, it's really hard to know even where you are now, let alone what might be around the corner, you know, when your data is so old, right? So, you know, the foundation of public health you know, 101 is good data, you know, to allow you to monitor emerging trends and to also, you know, evaluate what you're trying to do. So, you know, it was incredibly frustrating. I, you know, I will never forget when I was the director and we had one of the first fentanyl outbreaks in the country. And at the federal level, we had this incredible intelligence apparatus and even focused on drug issues, right? And I was so frustrated because the first time I really hear about fentanyl is when we have an outbreak here in the United States. So it was incredibly frustrating. And I think part of the response of the administration, not just federally, but that, you know, part, part of the situation was not having a significant data infrastructure at the state level to even report these data on a timely manner. And, you know, I, I do have to say, I think the CDC went to great lengths to kind of fund through a lot of their funding, you know, increasing the data infrastructure. So it was this, you know, kind of transition from prescription opioids to heroin, to fentanyl. And now we see, you know, now we see stimulants, you know, overdoses attached to stimulants on the increase as well. So, you know, so like many epidemics, it evolves and so should our strategies to do it. But, but I also think, you know, there are, kind of significant root cause issues to this epidemic, as well as to an epidemic of suicides and diseases related to alcoholism that we never seem to be able to get to, right? So we're always focused on kind of the one thing in front of us versus really trying to focus on what are root cause issues here that, you know, that are causing all of these diseases of despair. Absolutely. And I think that you anticipate a couple of themes that bring us to the current moment we're in now, where we're, first of all, trying to figure out what's going on on the ground in, in a moment when data may be very lacking. And second, trying to figure out what's driving it, because to the best of our understanding, overdoses continue to, to go upward in 2020. And with the pandemic, it seems to be making the situation a lot worse. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. And 
you know, I'll reflect a little bit of my time in Boston as emblematic of that. I, you know, I think that, you know, obviously we're kind of seeing changes to uh, around the lethality of the drugs that we have, you know, but, but I also think, you know, if you think of a lot of the strategies that we were implementing to distribute naloxone or sterile syringes, you know, it really required a lot of outreach and engagement. And many of those activities, I think, had to change because of it. I think that many people might have been reluctant to come to treatment programs because of the pandemic. So, you know, again, I think like anything, there's probably not one single factor that's driving what, you know, this dramatic increase. But I do think, you know, that because of the kind of public health activities that we had to implement as a result of the pandemic, I think are incredibly detrimental, you know, to our work around the the epidemic. So I think that affects a lot of the programs that served as a glide path to treatment and certainly protected people from fatal overdoses. So I think that, you know, it really challenges us to to kind of rethink what we're doing. I, I will say on the positive side of this, we've also seen changes at the federal level regarding the overly burdensome regulation that govern the provision of medications. And I think it also provides us with an opportunity to think about how we might kind of codify those sorts of regulatory changes uh, in ways that uh, endure past this pandemic as a way to engage people more and more easily engage in our uh, treatment programs, particularly those with medication. Could you expand on that a little bit? Because I don't know that our listeners all know about the medications that treat opioid addiction. So, you know, one of the great tragedies of this epidemic is that we have three highly effective medications, and particularly two, buprenorphine and methadone, that have been shown to be highly effective in reducing fatal overdoses. And also, quite honestly, launching people on a trajectory to long-term recovery. But, you know, even before the pandemic hit, these were highly underutilized medications. And, you know, one of the factors is that there are a set of separate regulations that govern the provision and administration of these medications that we don't in other areas of healthcare. So for methadone, for example, you know, highly regulated environment, you have to be observed taking these medications daily for up to six months before you're even entitled to take-home doses often because of the stigma and the community opposition to these programs. They're often located in hard to get to areas for many folks in the community. So, you know, so there are heavily burdensome regulations that govern who can administer and how these medications are administered. And I think early on, the federal government made some decisions, rightly so, to loosen some of those regulatory issues around both buprenorphine induction and methadone. And that, you know, I haven't seen a formal evaluation, but I think people on the ground say they are just, you know, enormously helpful in not only getting, but keeping people in treatment during this pandemic. Absolutely. And I would add maybe keeping them from getting COVID, they have to go to a program. That's right. Yeah. And if I hear what you're saying, a lot of the good thing that's happening right now is allowing treatment to kind of adapt to this socially distanced world that we're living in. But social distance also comes with a lot more loneliness. And you had talked about deaths of despair. How do you see that kind of fitting into the problem that we're experiencing now with people being on their own, maybe feeling more anxious or depressed about their lives and, you know, experiencing what we're all experiencing, just a huge amount of uncertainty? You know, this is where my own personal experience with addiction and recovery kind of, you know, intersects with the kind of policy and programmatic world. And, you know, I just remember the profound isolation that I experienced. You know, outwardly, it might not have shown, but, you know, there is this kind of desolation and isolation that is often a hallmark of people with addiction. And, you know, the the opposite of that, you know, if you think of recovery as about community, you know, you don't recover alone, you recover, you know, many people recover because they have a community of people that surround them. So, you know, you know, kind of community is really the opposite of kind of addiction in terms of its isolation. You know, so I think there is many, many concerns, not only in terms of keeping people from coming into treatment, but also not having a community, a support community around you to, you know, to really help you, particularly for people in early recovery when that is pivotal. You know, and again, I think we saw many, many programs, many recovery support programs 
transitioning, you know, to, to online and virtual support, which is really wonderful. Like, I think we should have been there anyway, you know, and not to say that that wholly can replace, you know, kind of the in-person experience. But, you know, I think that anything that we can do to kind of to create kind of virtual communities because of that isolation. So, you know, it does, you know, I think there are lots of, you know, worries, rightly so, that, you know, we'll see increased relapses, you know, because of the isolating conditions of the pandemic. And what advice would you give to someone who might themselves be wanting to get into treatment or to get some help right now or to a family member about how to access a community during this difficult situation? So one, you know, again, and and these are some of the kind of newer regulatory changes that, so, you know, in many respects now, um, and again, you know, I think that the pandemic actually pushed us, um, uh, you know, to kind of advance some of this work that the rest of healthcare. So there are, you know, lots more opportunities for telehealth and tele, you know, to create telehealth kinds of visits. You know, there are certainly a gamut of online recovery support meetings, and not only support meetings, but, you know, online communities that are exercising and doing whole sorts of different activities. So I think the way that we'll just have to engage is, you know, and again, it may be suboptimal, but at least, you know, kind of using video and telehealth platforms, you know, to be able to try to kind of recreate and and connect people to those kinds of resources. Great. I want to talk about another issue that I know was really important to you at the ONDCP, and that's stigma. Why is addiction such a uniquely stigmatized disease? So, you know, I have to say that the longer that I do this work, which is over 30 years now, the more I realize, and I think a lot of other people do, is that, you know, the manifestations of stigma as it relates to people, policy programs are just so profound and pervasive, right? So it exists at the personal level, manifests itself at the personal level, in people not wanting to seek treatment. It manifests itself at the clinical level where people feel, uh, where numerous studies show that people uh, get treated disrespectfully and shamefully in clinical settings. It manifests itself at the policy level when we were talking about that early on, where our response to this has largely been, these are bad people doing bad things. It manifests itself at the media level and your colleagues at the School of Public Health have done extensive work on the role that media and language play in terms of that. So, you know, I think if we're going to make enduring changes to this uh, to this issue, eradicating stigma is so foundational to the work that we do. So stigma sometimes just sounds kind of trite, you know, but it really is foundational to all of the work that we do. Because fundamentally, if we believe that people with addiction are not worth care, are not Uh worth saving, and these are bad people who make bad choices and are doing bad things, our response will always flow from that. And unless we see this, you know, unless we optically change our understanding of this and fundamentally change our understanding that this is a disease, then our response, unfortunately, I don't think won't change substantially. I do think to be optimistic, I do think we're changing that. And I think that in large part is, you know, has flowed from a lot of the academic work that's happening. You know, I think we've seen a vibrancy within the recovery community to be more open and honest. So I think that kind of, you know, sharing personal story and personal narrative is incredibly experienced. I think we're seeing just this huge increase in education and particularly medical education on addiction, you know, to help, you know, I think change clinical attitudes around this. So I do, and, and, I, and I hope and I believe that those are enduring changes. You know, I think we'll continue to see the acceleration and the manifestation of addiction as a health-related issue versus, you know, a volition, a choice, a criminal justice issue. You know, we're here, you know, just post the major day of voting, and I think we've seen some states move to decriminalize small amounts of, you know, drug possession. And, and again, I think this is, you know, I think we're seeing kind of a movement away from, you know, uh, kind of coupling drug use with criminal behavior. Yeah. And if I could pick up on on one piece of that, I think that um, another critical part of this is giving people a sense that this is a winnable issue, that there's a better way that we could move and that people can have really good lives after addiction. Uh, You know, I haven't seen recent polling, 
But again, you know, I think some work that your colleagues did at the School of Public Health show, you know, that one of the reasons that is kind of stigmatized and people don't seek treatment is people believe it doesn't work, right? And, you know, even though we do have highly successful kind of treatment programs and medications that have been proven to be effective. So, and this is where I think kind of personal stories matter, right? So historically, you know, people in recovery, and particularly people who found their recovery through 12-step programs, were, you know, anonymous. So people didn't see, like, their neighbor who was in recovery, you know, for a long time. Actually, on Tuesday, I celebrated my 32nd anniversary in recovery. Congratulations. And thank you. But, you know, but unfortunately, I think many, many people felt kind of squeamish about talking about their recovery. And I think rightly so. I think they were afraid of what their neighbors would think. I think they were afraid of employment repercussions. But, you know, part of what I tried to use my time at ONDCP, you know, is to really, and to use the bully pulpit that I had in very public ways to not only be public about my recovery, but encourage other people to be more open about their recovery as well. And, and I think we're seeing that. And, you know, it's really interesting that, you know, this is my kind of anecdotal take. I think when you have people talk about the opioid epidemic, no matter what level they are, people will often start from a place of personal experience. And, you know, I watch that and I think, wow, what a change when people wanted to really deny the fact that addiction was in their family and community. And so, I, you know, uh, again, it's not a scientific analysis, but at least my observation, you know, has led me to believe that people are much more open about how addiction has affected them or their families. Wonderful. Well, I think the idea that people can get better and have great lives is a, is a good, hopeful place to end this conversation. So Michael Botticelli, thanks again for joining us on the podcast. Great. Uh, happy to be there. And, you know, uh, just my profound thanks to you and your colleagues for the work that they've done on this issue. It really is. It really has made a huge difference, not only in my life, but I think in many people's lives. Thank you for what you do, too. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen-McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.